All right. And let's open it up. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to welcome Jennifer Martin, who's a physiotherapist and owner of Wave Therapeutics. Um, she has experience with people that have SMA and doing um, aquatic therapy. And we're really excited that you're here to hold this presentation. Jennifer, we're really looking forward to it. There's so many people in the community that are that are using wave therapy, I guess you would call it in your world, but yeah, aquatic therapy. Um, and I open it up to you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here and to get to be a part of the Cure SMA Canada National Conference. This is this is a great opportunity and um, a great honor to be a part of this conference. I want to get started today by um, introducing everyone to what we're going to talk about, and that's the practical side of the pool. And that relates to how do we use the pool for function, but also keeping in mind that we're using the pool for function and exercise and therapy and all of that in the time of a pandemic. And I was really hoping at this point um, in our progression that I could drop that whole pandemic part of this presentation. But now where we're at today, I feel like it's even more important for us to keep that in mind, not only in terms of a pandemic, but everyone in the SMA community understands that we have a pandemic, but flu season comes every year and we are always needing to be aware of how we handle being out in the community and in a pool setting um, at any time, pandemic or flu um, or not. So let's get started. What do I bring to the aquatic discussion? I am a physiotherapist with 25 years of practice doing aquatic physical therapy. Um, I've worked in muscular dystrophy clinics, in inpatient outpatient clinics. I am board certified in aquatic therapy. I founded Wave Therapies in 2001 so I could do one-on-one -on -one aquatic therapy um, for folks of all ages and abilities. The, my youngest client right now is about six months old. My oldest client is about 86. So I'm really fortunate that I get to see folks across the age spectrum from those really little ones, from those ones that we're catching with newborn screenings now, but that are still coming through us just to be screened to make sure that they're progressing. Um, and then I'm seeing folks all the way up, um, not with SMA that are 86 on my caseload right now, um, I think my oldest, the oldest person I have in the water with SMA right now is probably in their 30s. Um, and they are loving being in the water mm -hmm. as hopefully everyone will either attest to during, because of your own time in the water, or at least you'll get that inkling to maybe give it a try after hearing this presentation. Um, I have no disclosures, but I do have exercise sheets and I have lists of where I get all my products. I can get all that to Susie um, or you can contact me at my email address that's listed here and I'm happy to send that to you. National Conference for me is an opportunity to talk about being in the water with folks that either love it and are passionate about it or are terrified and haven't had the confidence to try it yet. And I love getting to speak to folks that are in both camps um, because I learn a lot from everybody. For folks that are in the water all the time, you have tricks and things that work for you that I haven't thought of because the water is such a great place for creativity. And so I love learning about those things. I was at the US National Conference a few years ago and a dad came up with a monofin and he said, this is the one way my child can be totally independent in the pool. I, it, a monofin is not something I use very often. A lot of pools have concerns with them. This young lady with her monofin was a completely independent swimmer in the pool. Um, and it was great to see that confidence and that independence and that active exercise and engagement with her body. It was awesome. And every year I have folks that um, say, I've never been in the pool, but I really want to give it a try. And how can I do it safely? And so hopefully this, for those that are in that, that camp, 
will give you some places to start and some places to feel like you have something to start with in your community pool or with your local therapist. Um, I love to, con con to collaborate on ideas um, for ways to improve independence, strength, balance, breath control. And I love to spark curiosity about what might be possible for exercise. I met with a woman with SMA. I met with her at a regional conference. She said, when I go to national conference, um, I want to be able, I want to, I want to get in the water with you. In the US National Conference, we have some pool time. So I got to the pool and she um, she said, okay, she was already in the water when I got there. And I said, all right, what do you, what do you want to work on? What, what is it that you want to try and explore here in the water? And she said, I just want to stand up. Okay. When was the last time you stood? When I was seven. And she was in her 50s. And so she really took that opportunity to find a goal and to explore the water and to be creative and to push her edges. Um, and with her, the support of her um, assistant, she was standing in the water and it was a great opportunity. And I can continue to connect with her and she is continuing to be up in the water multiple times a week. Um, so I love the opportunity to get people thinking about what can I do to help myself be more engaged um, with my movement and with my body. There's three things I want you to take away from this time. What does the water give me that gravity takes away? The water provides so much freedom um, that gravity can really hinder during the course of a day. So to get in and find that freedom in the water is spectacular. How do you maximize water safety from both a personal and a pandemic viewpoint? And water safety for me is essential. Every single time I get in the pool with every single patient I work with. And where and how do you start? Today, I wanna to give you some practical places, things to look at. How do you get yourself up and moving in the pool? What kind of exercises, what kind of activities? And how do you engage that with both trunk control and pulmonary control? So let's get going. Why do my clients use the water? I asked, I asked multiple clients, all of these happen to be folks with SMA. Why do you get in the water? Um, and the seven-year-old said, it's easier to move. It's fun. And I like the warm water. The pool I use is 90, between 92 and 93 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and we'll talk about pool temperatures in a little bit and why that's important for your ability to enjoy and engage in the water. And enjoy is three-fourths of being in the water because if it's not the right temperature your body's just working to stay warm and it's miserable so we'll talk about why that's important and what different things to look at we don't have to deal with pesky gravity that was from the parent of a different seven-year-old um because gravity is tough and in the water that is mostly eliminated and the freedom is pretty spectacular the water allows my son to walk and have fun. And this is from the parent um, of a young man who's a full-time power chair user, and he gets to get up and completely engage um, with all kinds of activities. My daughter is proud of what she has accomplished and the therapy allows her to feel the full capacities of her body. Um, and this is a little girl who does ballet in the pool we have bars, she does ballet. And then in the uh, later parts of our session, she also does boxing. And I'll show you what boxing looks like. She was so excited to be able to go boxing with her dad. It was pretty spectacular. The water is a place where everybody is equal. It is the great equalizer. Uh, Many years ago, I worked with a family. Um, the son was a full-time power chair user. Dad would get in with us every session. And, uh, and I told dad one day, I said, you know, I know you have a lot to do with work. We're good here if you don't wanna be in the water. Um, if you're just poolside to help with pulmonary needs as we need them, that, that's great. And he said, Jen, if I'm 
at all in the way of my son's therapy, please let me know because I'll get out. He said, but this is the one time where my son and I are just father and son. There's nothing between us. There's no bed. There's no chair. It's just us. This is why my clients use the water. And that dad stayed with us all the way until his son went to college. But I'm always aware of precautions and safety in the pool. I've got to be mindful of that every single time I get in the pool. And you'll hear a lot about safety and what are we, what are we looking for? This picture you can see here is the pool that I have the opportunity to work in. Um, it's a community pool. So everyone in my community can pay $7 and come in and use this 93 degree pool at any point. Um, and for this, I am truly thankful. I have two deck side lifts um, and you can see in the distance, there's a ramp. Um, so I can bring people in with water safe wheelchairs. Safety in the pool includes how you handle your health needs and how you evaluate the right pool setting for you. And safety in the time of COVID presents a whole new array of considerations. You can guess that trying to get a community pool open for folks with um, medical needs took a little bit of work. And that is what I look like about June of 2020. Just trying to get, find a way for the folks that I work with with SMA to get them back in the water. Um, how do you get in a pool? Do you use face masks? Do face masks work? Um, the hint there is they work poorly because as soon as your face mask gets wet, it's like having a wet octopus stuck to your face. It feels like that and it's really hard to breathe. So the CDC says no face masks in the pool. So how do we protect um, patients and the community and ourselves? What do we come up with? Um, this is what it looks like in reality for us. We use um, face shields. Our clients use face shields. We have some super cute ones for the kids that we work with. Um, they have dinosaurs or robots or whatever. Um, this allows for the best breathing potential and the best safety because clearly we need to be close with folks in the pool to ensure everyone's safety. COVID helped a lot with pool creativity, a lot with pool creativity. COVID gave us, um, gave a lot of folks in the community I work with a chance to say, wow, being in the pool is essential for either my health or my spouse's health or my child's health. The pool I work at was closed for five months while we, um, figured out the best way to maintain and maximize safety. And in that time, I had families get incredibly creative. So you can see this pool here on the right. Um, this was actually designed into someone's home when they built it. They knew water was essential. It has a treadmill in it. And they are in that multiple times a week. It's awesome. We had probably four families get hot tubs. And I like hot tubs because they're size-wise workable for most families. Um, if you have a backyard, they don't generally require extra permits. Hot tubs are great because we can turn that temperature down to that ideal therapeutic 92, 93, especially for the kids that I work with. That to be in a regular hot tub temp is too warm for them. So we turn it down during the week so kids can get in and play. And then we turn it back up on the weekend so mom and dad can have some time. Because I found that the more people that are invested in whatever water system you have at home, the more it gets used, the more it gets cared for, um, and the more longevity it has within your family for both for you, your spouse, or your child. In regards to size, I have some families that have a full length lap pool, maybe not a full width, but a full 25, a full 25 yard lap pool. 
well, that's great, but that's not reality for a lot of the folks I work with. I have a lot of folks that use hot tubs. During the pandemic, I had a family with a little guy. He's three, almost four. They went to Home Depot. They got a plastic garbage can. They would fill it up with warm water a couple times a week and plunk him in it. And he thought it was awesome. Now, that's not perhaps the most ideal setup, but for this family during a time where things were really uncertain, it worked really well for them. Uh, as far as depth goes, it depends on what your purpose is. There are some tubs out there that are super shallow, three feet deep. It's great if you wanna float. If you wanna stand and you're six feet tall, that's not gonna work very well. And so you really need to facet in what are your goals and then what pool can meet those goals. Most folks that I work with have a pool between three and a half and four feet deep. For a lot of the folks I work with, that's great. For some of the folks I work with that um, have later onset SMA, they are taller, those shorter, those pools with lower depth do not work as well because they just don't get the water support. Um, so having a pool that's four and a half, five feet deep for some folks that are super tall is essential and that's not as easy to find in a hot tub. Uh, I had one family put in a swim spa. It was about four feet deep. So it was perfect for their kids. We put the kids in multiple times a week. Mom was a triathlete trainer. And so she used the pool on the weekends to train for triathletes. And then we turned it back up on the weekends, on the weekdays for the boys. Again, just another way of thinking creatively. How do we make the water work for the most people and meet the greatest number of goals for the family? I am always, always aware of pulmonary considerations when you get in the water. This is where you have the greatest chance of having issues and where folks really need to be wise. The pressure of the water, simply just getting in the water, for some people, that pressure against your chest is enough to cause anxiety, is enough to feel like you're short of breath. It can make breathing much more challenging just because there's so much more pressure that you don't have to deal with out of the water. When I run into these situations, remember that deck lift that we saw a couple pictures ago, I'll bring the chair down. When people feel like they're getting too much pressure, we'll bring that chair up a little bit. And then when they feel like they've got their breath back under them, we'll bring them back into the water. Generally, a couple times in and out, and they feel like they've got their breathing under control. Their body's had a chance to re-regulate and they're good to go. Sometimes during a session, I'll need to lift someone up just again to get their chest a little bit further out of the water. Um, and sometimes we'll put them on their back. Again, that can help with that feeling of, I just can't get a breath that's deep enough. Because that anxiety when you can't get a deep breath is really disconcerting. It causes a lot of, um, it can cause a lot of fear of the water where really if we just slow things down and let your body re-regulate, we can let that anxiety fade and you can really get in and enjoy that space. Pulmonary equipment needs at the pool. I work with multiple folks with um, ventilators, Everyone I work with in the pool, um, in the community pool that I work with that you saw that picture of, if they have a ventilator, it's all passive blow by ventilation, the sip and puff system. I do not work at a pool where I can provide the safety or the manpower for folks with trachs. All of the folks with the passive ventilation, we back their chairs up to the edge. We have an extra long cord for their sip and puff system, and we just have that poolside. An AMBU bag uh, is required for my the folks that I see at the community pool, just in case there's some sort of vent failure. I have We have the ability to provide vent support if need be. Um, and I have used that on a couple of occasions. Um, once because a vent ran out of, of battery and we needed to go charge it. Uh, I'm gonna pause right here because I forgot to say way back at the beginning, 
that if you can hold your questions until the end, I do see that raised hand, that I will take all questions at the end. I gave us a little bit of space for that. Thank you so much because I forgot to say that. Um, we have used the Ambu bags sometimes because it's just easier for where we are in the pool um, and it has worked out fine. The American Physical Therapy Association says that folks with invasive ventilation are not suitable to be in the water. Uh, I will tell you that again, in the community pool I work at, I can't provide a safe environment. I will also tell you that I know multiple folks that are trait for ventilation that do really enjoy the pool in a very controlled manner. Um, and so if that pertains to you or your family, um, the utmost caution clearly needs to be taken. Uh, suction. If you or your family member use a suction regularly, then regularly, like not when you're sick or have a cold, but it's something that you need periodically throughout the day, then that section needs to be poolside during um, any time you're in the water. And the reason is when you get moving, it's easy to get some of that mucus moving up from your lungs. And if that suction machine is in the parking lot or in the locker room, it is too far away when we need it quickly. So it needs to be poolside if that's something you use frequently. If it's something you just use when you have a cold, um, generally my folks don't have their suction poolside and I don't recommend um, going to pool therapy. If you have a cold, get that, get yourself healthy and then get back in the water. I have a lot of folks that use collars for airway safety. Um, I love collars and I hate them at the same time. And I'll explain why. Collars can provide great independence and we have lots of folks that use them. I, you can see here's a picture of three of them. These are probably three of the six that I have. Um, people often ask me what is the best collar and I have no idea. I have no idea what the best collar for you is because each collar provides such different support and allows for different movement that the best collar is really the one that you find works best for you after trying a couple of them. Um, the blue one down in the left corner is one of the types that I generally use with our younger folks. Most of the adults that I work with like the other two collars. Um, but then there's those other three collars that there's always someone that's like, this is the best collar ever because it helps to keep their face out of the water, gives a little bit of stability um, and that is essential. So they provide stability, but they're not life jackets. And so if you can't write yourself in the pool, then you need to make sure if you use a collar for safety that you always have someone within arm's reach because if you get flipped, if someone walks into the pool um, and causes a moderate wave, it is possible to flip over. Um, so you always need to have someone there uh, for safety if you cannot write yourself. So why is water better than a gravity filled space? I love water because it provides all of these, all of these areas. It gives input to each one. From a sensory side, the water completely surrounds you. It is the one time you can move and get feedback in your body to your body from all spaces. To me, it's essential that folks have their hands in the water and that they're using their hands to help propel because you get so much sensory feedback from your hands to your brain and just to get that input is huge. I worked with a young man who was a power chair user from the time he was 16 months old, full-time power chair user, loved to be in the water. He's off at college now, I'm not seeing him anymore. Um, and he loved to be in the water he loved to swim on his back and work on his shoulder range of motion that way. He said, Jen, can I hit my head on the wall when we get to the end? I'm like, dude, why would you want to do that? What? I don't, 
why, why would you want to hit your head? He goes, well, Jen, I spent all my time in my chair. I don't ever crash into anything. This is the one time I could crash and be safe. And as I said, he did have a head collar on. He didn't have a lot of speed. So I knew he couldn't over crash his collar. I said, all right, that's fine. You want to crash into the wall? Go ahead. And every week he crashed into the wall and he thought it was so awesome. And one day his mom came in, she's like, why do you let him keep doing that? He's going to get hurt. I said, well, he's not really going to get hurt because his head's not actually hitting the wall, but he is getting that, that impact of bumping into something and feeling that through his body. And that's something that he doesn't get in his power chair. And she was like, oh, all right, I get it. Okay. And so he continued to crash. He never got hurt, but he always loved that sensory input that really can only be found in the water. The water provides incredible postural support. I have some videos that we'll see in a few minutes that will give you a chance to see that, especially if you haven't experienced that in the water. The water also can provide postural resistance. The faster you move, the more you have to work on staying up in the water, the more you have to use your muscles against that friction of the water. It's a spectacular medium for providing both support and resistance, depending on how you choose to use it when you get into that space. The physiologic benefits include cardiopulmonary, right? That opportunity to breathe against pressure. If all you do is get in the pool and breathe, you are exercising the muscles in your ribs and in your pulmonary system. And that in and of itself for some people is why they get in the pool. Digestion, especially if you're standing and you're a full-time chair user, it is the opportunity for your digestive system, your legs, everything to stretch out a little bit and things to get moving, um, which is really difficult to achieve on land if you're full-time in a chair. It improves your kidney function. You really do have to pee when you get out of the water for a really real reason. The water pushes that fluid that gathers in your feet and in your legs, it pushes that back up, all the pressure, all that pressure from the water, sends it back through your kidneys and gets that cleared out. That's a big deal. And finally, social engagement. We talked about this earlier with my um, young man and his dad. The pool is a place where I see typically developing kids, again, because I'm in a community pool, sometimes I have families that are just in there to play and they don't know the difference when we're in the pool my kids the kids i'm playing with just have cool toys and so we're really interesting we're really fun and we can play ball we can do all that and everybody is the same everybody has the same stability and the same function and from a social side that is huge every exercise should consider, can you incorporate breathing into the motion? Can you find a way to use the motion to improve your pulmonary function? This is what I think about every time someone gets in. How can I make this so when they move, they learn to use their breath to control the motion. You learn to move by breathing instead of by holding your breath and everybody, has done that, right? Where you hold your breath to pick something up or move something. I want you to be able to move and breathe because it helps with clearly pulmonary function. It helps decrease anxiety because when you hold your breath, that oxygen is not going to your brain and that increases your anxiety. The more we breathe, the better off our body is as a functional whole. Can you include trunk balance, strength, engagement? A lot of the folks that I work with, with SNI, are full-time chair users, which is great because they're totally independent in their mobility at home and at school, but they don't get so much opportunity to use those muscles in their back, in their trunk, in their abs. All are essential for digestion, for spine stability, for breathing, for um, ADL function. And so I work to incorporate all that into what I'm doing. Does the requested motion, does what we're working on in the pool 
can it help what is happening on land? And if it's pulmonary side, absolutely. Um, so I'm always looking, what are you doing on land and how can what we do in the water improve that? And is there an endurance component? There have been multiple studies that have come out within the last year on the need for endurance activities for folks that are chair users. Uh, and the water is the perfect place to incorporate that. And so I work on how can we look at endurance activities in the aquatic setting. So where do we start? Where's the best place to find um, safety to figure out your ex exercises? How do we make that work in a pool? Safety first all the time. This includes general water safety. This includes airway safety, right? Airway safety for some may be having that collar on. And again, the collar is great. If I wanna work on head control though, if, if that's where we're at, especially with some of the younger folks I work with, I may have that collar on for a little bit, but it doesn't help me so much when I'm trying to get head control. So I'll probably take it off for that portion of therapy sessions. Um, and then I'm even closer as far as watching for safety, as far as making sure that we have airways protected and such. If suction or BiPAP is part of your regular airway maintenance, it needs to be poolside. We talked about this before, but I always bring it up again because it is really important um, from an airway safety standpoint. When I get in the water, the plan is to start where people feel safe and comfortable and then advance from there. So um, about six weeks ago, I started with someone who was terrified of the water and we would walk down the ramp. This is not someone with SMA. We would walk down the ramp and I have bars on the side of my pool. She would walk around the corner and hold on to the bars. We did six weeks worth of exercising on the bars. We would take no more than three steps away from the bars and back to the bars. We're finally to the point where we can get halfway across the pool and go back to the bars. I've got to start where she feels safe and then move into a place that is a little bit more challenging. But until folks know they're safe, you really need to, you really need to keep your focus there. Start what seems easy and add complexity. You can add complexity with resistance by adding buoyancy. Um, so pushing floats under the water and really having to control that or affecting your, the duration of your activity. Maybe you start pushing the ball five times. Maybe by the end of it, you're pushing it 30 times. Again, just increasing that complexity of activity. The water temperature matters. And part of that feeds back to feeling safe and comfortable. If you're in a pool that is 82 degrees Fahrenheit, um, all my temperatures are gonna be in Fahrenheit. If you're in a pool that's 82, that's your typical lap pool. That's where those Olympic swimmers are swimming. Might even be a little bit cooler. That temperature is fine. If you can move fast enough to keep your core temp up. But if you cannot move fast enough to keep your core temp up and you're in a pool that's that cool, your body's first and only thought is, I have to stay warm, I have to stay warm. And it goes into a mode where that's its complete focus. Where when I'm in the pool and I'm working with folks, I don't wanna work on keeping your core temp up. I wanna work on active movement. I wanna work on range of motion. I wanna work on how do we get you moving in a space where you're independent. And so the water temperature for me is really important. 92 to 93 degrees is kind of that sweet spot. That spot where it's neutral warmth, you're not too hot, it's not a hot tub. Hot tubs are around 100 to 104. You're not too cold, that 80 to 82 degree lap pool. Um, and you really can just focus on moving because your body's in a comfortable space. I have had some folks that are 
walking part-time or full-time with SMA that say that 92 to 93 degrees is too hot because they can move enough to keep their core temp up. So they're happier. Folks that have that extra mobility are generally happier in an 82 to 86 degree pool. It might feel a little cool when you get in, but once you start moving, you can move fast enough, your body warms back up and it's a good space to be. For all the folks I work with right now that are full-time power chair users, that 92 to 93 degree water is ideal. That 92 to 93 degree water can be more difficult to find, however. That's a true therapy temp pool. Some therapy pools will go up to 95. I find that to be too warm. I have some folks that find it to be perfect. Um, most of the folks I work with that have SMA find that 92 to 93 to be ideal. No breath holding. I said this earlier, I'll say it again, because I really mean it. Pulmonary function is essential for me in the water because it's not only a water skill, but it's a life skill. If I can teach you to use your pulmonary system effectively in the water, that's gonna carry over on land. And people tell me that. I hear you telling me all the time that I can't hold my breath when I move. And now I can move better. That's what I want. I want that pulmonary function to carry over. So with all activity, we combine breathing with movement to maximize function. I start just by getting arms up away from your chest. So if you're sitting right now, take a, take a moment and just look at where your arms are. And I suspect in 95% of the folks that are hearing me right now, your arms are down next to your chest, right next to your ribs on your side, which is fine. It means you're probably using more the front of your chest to breathe. You're probably feeling well oxygenated. But if, I, if you pull your arms up away from your chest and you take a deep breath, now you can feel the side of your lungs, the side of your ribs expand and move apart. That's what I want. I want your entire chest to have that opportunity to move. I want the sides of your lungs. I want the front. I want it all to expand and move as much as possible. Yes, I am aware that a lot of folks have spinal fusions and we have a lot of folks in the pool with spinal fusions. Um, and we get as much pulmonary function as we can. If you have a spinal fusion, it's even harder to get your abs to work. But we found a couple things in the pool that work really well just to start finding those muscles and reminding the body that they're there and they work. Uh, on that topic of spinal fusion, since we're there sort of briefly, I have worked with multiple people that were in the pool and independent. They had their spinal fusion and getting back in the water after a spinal fusion can be really um, frightening and in some cases terrifying. Just not knowing that how your body being so different is gonna function in the pool. And if you're in that camp and I meet someone at national conferences every year that says, you know, I used to get in the water, but now I have a spinal fusion and I just don't think I can do it anymore. Hear me when I say that I have lots of folks post spinal fusion, find that freedom again in the water. You can get back in the water. Your support's going to be a little bit different. Um, and that freedom is still there for you. We move arms away from chest in midline to breathe so you can get your chest most often. So when I slide my arms out, I breathe in. When I slide my arms back together, it pushes the air out. And that's how I start to get that coordination between movement and breathing. So arms go out, I breathe in. I push my arms back together. It's like squeezing the air out of my lungs. I breathe out. So what does that look like? This is where I start a lot of the time. These are one inch Velcro floats that are on Krista's arms. Krista is one of the therapists that works for me. She sees um, pediatrics only. Um, and is probably one of the most creative folks that I get to work with. Um, 
these one inch floats just bring her arms up and away from her chest. She has no muscle energy ex um, being expended at this point. And she can use, if she were a full-time chair user, now she has her arms to use in a completely new space than when she's in her chair, up at 90 degrees away from her body, a new shoulder position, which is helping to get some range of motion, um, different motion for her trunk muscles, for her pecs, and for the entire back um, sheet muscles that run down both the, her spine and the back of her shoulder. And she gets her arms away from her chest and really gets that lateral chest to expand. This is a great place to first adjust to water pressure. Um, often, and you'll see we have a kid on a chair coming up where we can modify that um, a little bit, that pressure, and give a chance to play. So what do we do after we get arms away? What does that look like? How do we progress? Well, I could add resistance. The cuffs on the left, those blue fins are great because you don't have to have any grip. Those Velcro on, I can put them around ankles, I can put them around wrists, and I can get uh, more resistance that way without having to have grip strength. So either if you don't have grip strength or you have hand contractures, I can still get resistance either to the arms or the legs. Those things have been spe spectacular. The things, the green um, grips on the right, those are what we call boxing gloves. Um, they have some other fancy name, I'm sure. But we use those, especially for the kids, they love to go boxing. They come in three different resistance levels. These are the lowest level. Um, and they're cool green slime color, so the kids think they're awesome. Another way to get resistance. What does this look like in real life? Well, we start to make it a little bit more dynamic. We, um, the way this young man is positioned, his arms just popped up against the buoyancy of the water. You can see his elbows away from his chest. Um, and he's, we're gonna use that ball for resistance. And so right now his arms are up. He's using that ball and you can see when he pushes it, watch his trunk. He's got to work to stay up just a little bit. He's got to push that ball dynamically and he's got to catch it dynamically. This is a great place to progress from arms away to um, being more dynamic. He's still sitting here. Um, this is how he likes to progress getting in the water. He gets his body used to breathing. And um, we often play this as a game with ABCs or um, something, something else that's, that's engaging that the kids dig. When to wait and when to float. I often get asked, um, so if I'm going to do an exercise program, when would I use weights and when would I use floats? So I wanted to take a second to talk about that. You saw the one of the types of arm floats that Krista had on a few slides ago, those Velcro um, wrap-on um, floats. Those come in a one inch and they come in a two inch. So I can use them around arms or legs. I'll put them on legs if I want either to help in floating on your back to make sure that legs are staying up at, leg level, at water level, or I can use them as resistance training. I can put them on, on someone's legs where you have to work to keep that float pushed underwater. It makes your hips and your quads work quite a bit to have to stay stable and push, keep that buoyancy pushed underwater. It's great for that. So it can, the floats can be supportive. They also can be resistive. It just depends on how I use them. You have to know what you want. Are you looking for support or are you looking for resistance when you're applying the floats? They can give buoyancy and that can be good or bad depending on what you want. If you want stability and you're upright, I don't always put floats on someone's feet. I will instead put weights on someone's feet. Um, and you can see I have a variety of weights down here on the bottom right of an array of 
weight, that little purple one on the top right corner is a half pound. It's great for the little guys I work with. And it just gives a little bit of contact with the ground. It just gives a little bit of input um, to keep someone more upright. I find that these work that weights are really effective for folks with hip flexion contractures, I have a lot of people tell me, you know, I'd love to be upright on the water, but as soon as I get upright, my hips go back and I fall on my face and that's really disconcerting. And so I just don't like to do it. And I hear that. So oftentimes we'll do a float around their trunk and then some weights around the ankle, lightweight. If it's a teenager or an adult, um, I might do a pound and a half weights, which are those ones in the middle there. For some of the younger kids I see, I'll do a pound or a half pound. And they just give that little bit of anchor to the ground and a little bit of support. We'll move, we'll progress an activity, we'll move from being and sitting to being on your back. Back takes the pressure off your breathing. And I have a lot of folks that really need that time after they've adjusted to sitting. They just want that break. And so we'll do some work on their back. Uh, back activities are a great place to do active range of motion, to work on endurance, that continual muscle energy, um, and to work on some stability and mobility exercises, to work on having stable hips, to work on being able to get full range of motion at your shoulders. Let's watch some of that. So this is something we do in supine. This is that same young man, he moved from sitting um, he has a different neck collar on than we saw earlier because this is the one he likes. Again, there's no perfect neck collar. It's the one that you like. Um, so he has, he's using this opportunity to get active range at his shoulders. He has nowhere near the shoulder range on land, but in the water, he can get all the way up and she's coordinating that motion with when your arms come up, I want you to breathe in. Oftentimes we'll coordinate this with the same leg motion also. So when his arm, so it's like doing jumping jacks, um, arms up, legs apart, and then arms come down to your side, legs go together. Also cord, always coordinated with breathing. I could put those cuffs on that you saw earlier, those blue wraparound cuffs, if I wanted to give him more resistance and make this more of a strengthening activity. The focus of this activity is range of motion. So we're not putting cuffs on him for resistance at this point. The flippers give him a little bit of resistance, but also help him to go fast. And he likes that. We will then often progress to standing. We'll start a lot of our standing time with walking forwards, walking backwards, sideways, marching. Forwards and backwards just gets those hip muscles moving. Sideways helps with balance. Marching also helps with balance and coordination. And the kids think it's cool that they have a place to march. The adults I work with think it's cool that they actually have the ability to balance and do that type of coordinated activity. Um, because on land, clearly that's very difficult. In the water, to be able to coordinate your muscles, to be able to march is a big thing. Um, and definitely helps with trunk skills, with active range of motion, and with cross-body coordination. So there's different ways to stand. This young man has a float wrapped around him. Um, he loves his seahorse. We saw him earlier with that. Uh, and I believe he has the half pound weights on. This little girl loves to use the wall. She's totally independent there, but this is how she's most stable going sideways. She's independent going forwards and backwards. Sideways, she needs a little bit more support from her hips. And so we just use the wall to help support that. It's a great option. Here's boxing. We talked about it before. Um, and here's what it looks like. Here's what I love about boxing. This young man's a full-time power chair user. So he's got his arms up totally away from his chest. He's reaching all the way across his body. When his right arm punches, it reaches 
across as far as he can get over his other knee. Well, he lost it there. Um, there he goes. There's good reaching all the way across his body. He's getting that rotation at his trunk. He doesn't have a spinal fusion, so he can get that rotation. He can get that elbow extension to use those muscles in the back of his trunk, all while coordinating it with breathing. This has been um, a really great activity for a lot of our folks because it incorporates so many different activities. I could do it just with floats wrapped around his wrist. I could uh, have him hold floating barbells would be another way to do it. Uh, I could give him the next size up of these grips if I wanted him to have more resistance. Here's another activity that we do a lot of in standing. It's called spinning spider, but the, when I do it with kids, they get to pick whatever animal they want. 90% of my eight-year-old girls pick unicorns um, and the boys all pick monkeys. I don't know why. The adults, it's just spinning on the wall. We don't pick, we don't pick uh, animals. This can be adapted to whatever abilities you have. Let's watch him do this. So he's gonna reach around. That right arm is gonna come back. So he's getting an excellent stretch through the front of his chest. There he goes. And he comes all the way around. So he's getting those posterior spinal muscles working. He's getting a stretch through the front of his chest. He's getting those anterior chest muscles to move also, um, all while being upright in the water. Not everybody has this kind of arm motion, but you can adapt it to whatever arm functions, arm abilities you have. Not all the kids I have that do this do it standing. Sometimes they do it sitting on my leg, depending on how tall they are and what their trunk function is. Endurance activities, we talked about this um, a while ago. Endurance activities are important. I start generally very slow. Cardio exercise is challenging if you're a full-time power chair user. Um, so the, contact, the concept of that continual movement on land is exhausting and really hard to find. I do have some people that use those arm bikes. Um, I have a couple folks that can use uh, leg bikes on the floor or stationary bikes, but most of the folks that I work with that is just biomechanically, it's not a possibility. And there, as I said, have been multiple studies outlining the importance of how do we do endurance activities. This snorkel um, has been awesome. We have found great uh, success using a full face snorkel. I have found much greater success using a full face snorkel, a snorkel that goes all the way around the face and then has a separate compartment, a separate um, compartment that's kind of um, blocked off with silicone for breathing. So your eyes have a compartment, your mouth and nose have a compartment. There's no coordination with putting that snorkel piece actually in your mouth. We've eliminated that. It allows folks to swim continuously and to be on their stomach. And for so many of the folks I work with, to be on their stomach is such a foreign place because of hip flexion contractures, because of pulmonary restrictions. And so this has given us an incredible freedom. This little girl will go for up to five minutes in the pool. Um, and we take a break every five minutes for sure, just to make sure that folks are getting good airflow and they're not getting too tired. They're not getting too short of breath. Um, we set up a system with every one of our clients that are using full face snorkels. Um, that if they are starting to get some leak or they need help, they shake their head no, and we pull them up immediately. And that system has to be set whenever you're not, whenever someone's going to have their face in the water so they know that they are safe and that they have a very quick escape route if they can't get themselves up. There have been some issues with folks using these for long term, like 45 minutes um, outdoor snorkeling. Um, where there have been some oxygen exchange issues. This is why we keep these um, to five minute 
spurts so we can make sure that oxygenation is doing fine. We spend a lot of time upright in the water. This young woman has um, this young woman has notable hip flexion contractures. She's a full-time power chair user and has been since she was two um, in the water. She is independent and upright. The ring she uses is something that her family designed because there is no greater inventor of aquatic equipment than people that are using the pool, than people that know if I, if I just could find something that had just this much float or just that much support. Um, I have seen some of the greatest things come out of the community of aquatic therapy users because you figure out what you need and what's not available and how to modify that to meet your specific needs. So she took a pool ring, she turned it into a circle, she added a couple extra spots of flotation and she's awesome. So we're gonna see her here. This is her deep water running. Her feet aren't on the floor. She's totally independent. Um, we use this for her endurance activity. Um, this is where she started. Just walking on the floor, just getting a feel for her body. She's super shallow here. You can see her hips are still quite flexed. She does, she prefers to not have weights on her feet and the way her float is set up, it still allows her to be um, independent and upright. I start a lot of folks with their endurance activities. Um, I start a lot of folks with their endurance activities. We just start with a two minute walk test. How many widths of the pool in mid chest deep water can you do in two minutes? And we work up from there. And some people get to a minute and they're like, I'm done. Great, that's great. That gives me a great place to start. Some people will take I had one kid come in, um, came in about six months ago and he could walk a width and a half of the pool in two minutes. When I tested him two weeks ago, he was up to six widths. He got his endurance up, he got his motion up, he figured out how to use his breathing and his arms to help. Um, and now we can start to increase that time. We'll either increase it with his walking time or we'll increase it with his um, either swimming on his stomach with his full face snorkel or um, kicking on his back and doing his arm exercises. I often get asked about stretching in the water. Um, what about stretching in the water? Is it possible to do there? Is it a good idea? I love stretching in the water. It's a great spot because once you get everything moving, right? Once you've gotten your body moving, you've gotten that fluid moving in your joints, it's the perfect time to stretch. But I have a few things to be aware of if you're gonna help someone stretch in the pool. You have to be cautious of joints. Um, you want your hands as close together around a joint as possible because we need to protect the long bones for fracture. Um, you wanna stretch after you're warm. Don't just get in the pool and then stretch. Do your activities and then stretch at the end because your joints are warm, your muscles are warm and you're gonna get the best benefit from it. I say the same thing to my folks that stretch on days they're not in the water. Get up, take a shower, move around a little bit and then stretch, you're gonna get better stretch for your time. Hands above and below the joint, not right on top of it. This is a knee joint. See my hands, I have one hand on the calf, I have one hand on the thigh, but I don't have a hand right on top of that kneecap. If my hands are close to the joint to minimize that long bone strut, that long bone tension, um, but I'm not crushing the joint. It has been such an honor to be a part of the Canadian National Conference. Thank you so much for including me. Hopefully I've given you food for thought for some questions and hopefully I've given you a moment to expand your curiosity and jump into a pool. I would love to take questions if there are any. If you have a question for Jennifer, just please unmute yourself and go right ahead and ask. I have one to start with, if it's yeah. okay again. And that is um, the brand names of the, 
the neck floats that you showed mm -hmm. what, you, what would you recommend for a younger child and what would you recommend for an adult that is requiring them so the one that was pictured in my slide was the waterway babies one i have a lot of folks that like that um auto does a very similar one i have folks really like that too it, or at all? the products are very similar um and it really just depends on kind of fit and handling for families as to what i find families like more and how do you spell auto is that with an o or an au an o mm -hmm. I find that most adults like the HydroFit pillow, which was that black one. Uh, and I am blanking on the name for the yellow one. A lot of people like the large yellow one that I have. Um, it provides a ton of stability. It just depends on kind of your head, neck, spacing and configuration if it works for you. Um, the little guy you saw floating on his back with that green neck collar that is uh, made by neck doodle and they do both that green collar and they do the hot pink seahorse okay thank you uh-huh i think yan did you have a oh and shanna um i don't know who was first i think shanna was first oh okay shanna sorry no, it's totally okay. Um, just quickly, so where could you buy the collars? I buy them all online, and I if you email me, I will send you the website uh, links for all of those. Okay, perfect. Um, now, um, the one that I made a few notes here. Um, now, my guy, this is a comment slash um, also question. Perfect. So my guy is trached and bent, and I do understand that you guys don't allow them because it is invasive. I just want to say it's it's a bit disappointing because that's the only place I could get him free. And I don't understand, like I'm in Ontario, and I do understand the, the liability, the risk, everything. Mm -hmm. But if it's done safely and having more hands, like having a PT, having his nurse, having a parent, it's actually giving him that opportunity to move like actually last weekend was the first time I got him in a pool yeah. um and I think I made it and so the question I had is I had a life jacket on him but I'm thinking that wasn't it was good for the first time just to see how he would react to the water yeah, yeah. but then listening to the pulmonary that probably wasn't a good idea <laughs> so Shanna I'm so appreciative that you brought that up because the APTA says no um and the system I work in is the the pool that I work in most of the time is a community pool and I can't provide a safe environment there. But that being said, you are 100% correct that the water is the only place for folks with trachs to be able to move independently. Right. And but it really takes a village to make sure that it's safe. Um, I have had the opportunity at the US National Conference to work with multiple folks with trachs in the pool. Um, again, we have it, we have it pretty well controlled. Everybody's got their nurse, everybody's got a parent. I mean, we have we've got a ton of people there, and we really work on what what is the best way to keep folks safe because we've got to keep pretty much from mid chest totally dry mid chest up totally dry um, and we have come up with a couple different ways to do that um, families that have loved ones that use trachs are so amazingly creative um, to be able to get their loved ones in the water and moving actively yeah, no, exactly. And it's, um, it's give, yeah, ex I'm just gonna leave it at that. And now one question, do you yeah. have like a tip sheet on like starting, like you had a lot of great information, but like, if you're first starting, this is what to do, this is what we recommend trying and then kind of like make moving your way up. And then also how do you keep the feet? Well, I think you answered that with uh, feet weights that you could help keep feet down to stand. Yeah, just those little ankle weights, um, those okay. half pound, those one pounds, those pound and a half for my 
bigger folks, but you know, for my, most of my adults, the pound and a half's work fine. It's not a gold's gym workout, right? It's really just to provide those weights, just provide that anchoring, especially if you've got the hip flexion contractures. Okay. And the floats. So I guess it, I'm guessing mm-hmm. you'll buy, you'll get those also at the same place that you get the collars. I get the floats at the same place. I get that black poofy head collar. Okay. All right. And if Perfect. you email me, I'll send you the whole list. It's all those, the floats and that black poofy head collar are by HydroFit. Okay. Um, I don't have an email, but if you can put that in the chat, it would be great. <laughs> yes. So I, if, if I, if I you like email, email, send that to Susie. Yeah. Okay. If you, if you want um, Jennifer's email, just email me and I'll, I'll give that to you. No problem. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry. I missed Welcome. the first five minutes this morning. It was a bit early for us out here. And also, so. <laughs> I totally get it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And I think Jan was next. Is Jan? Yeah. Jan, sir. Yeah. Sure. I would like to say thank you for the presentation. I, I found a lot of helpful uh, information. We, it's uh, hard for us uh, in Quebec uh, to access uh, to uh, that kind of uh, service, uh, but uh, we do by uh, ourselves. Uh, we have a hot tub, a small pool, and uh, it's uh, interesting to, to see what we try to do intuitively. It's uh, to, to validate with your information, we do the, the good thing. So uh, I, I would like to know, to know the, the full mask uh, to, to make the smart girl. Is it safe? Um, they <laughs> don't have leak because we have a type one. Uh, my son is a type one. He has uh, nine uh, years old. He loves uh, to go uh, in the pool. And um, it's uh, really hard for us to put it, uh, how we say, sur le on the, on the flap. <laughs> so I would like to try to put it, uh, how we say, uh, at le ventre. Not on the back, but on the other side. In right, the right, right, on a stomach. And maybe uh, with that kind of, uh, with uh, the, this full face, it could help us uh, to maintain it. To maintain his, so did I understand that he has, does he have a vent? Uh, just for the night. Okay, does he have a trach? No, no, no. No, He's, he uh, just has a BiPAP at night. Yes, and he, he can stand, he, he, he likes to be uh, stand up and uh, he has good uh, capacities. Uh, when when he stand up in the pool, he, he like this, it's, uh-huh. it's not too hard for him. So uh, we think on, uh, on the table, he, don't, he really don't like to be uh, on the flap, uh, but I hope maybe in the pool it, it could be possible, but uh, yep. I'm a little bit uh, worried about uh, the... The mouth, he, he, he don't have um, l'habitude to, to have the head like this. So maybe with a mask, he could uh, stand uh, in better shape. So it would be, it's something that we've had good success with, that full face snorkel. It comes in adult and kid sizes. Um, we had, we used to have kids come with kids snorkel sets. You know, your traditional snorkel where you have the piece in your mouth. That, that just was not, it was not reliably functional for us. Um, it was stressful for the kids, which made it stressful for everybody else. So the full face snorkel, that little girl you saw, um, she, had, she had some comfort in the water, um, but she couldn't be all the way on her stomach. I'll tell you now that she's practiced with her full face snorkel, she will go on her stomach. She chooses to go on her stomach with her goggles on only. Um, but for any prolonged swimming, she always has her snorkel on. She gets a good seal. And I find if you get the right size, the seal is good. Um, but again, I always, you know, we always have that safety mechanism in place. For the kids, they either like it. Um, I, honestly, all the kids I've tried it with have thought it was pretty cool. Um, I have some adults that we've really had to work them into it from a pulmonary side so they don't feel um, like they're like they have pulmonary compromise. Um, so we have the kids put their face in the pool before they go anywhere to see if they got leaks around the edge. Um, we will oftentimes put goggles on and we'll go under with them. So we're underneath them when they're in the water so we can see what's happening. 
um, it's really that seal is what's the important part and figuring out if that seal is holding um, and provides a good seal for your kid's bone structure, that's what you really need to facet out before you get too far into the adventure. Um, we've done some where we'll put the, the snorkel on and then we'll pour water over it to see, you know, so before they're even on their stomach, are we getting anything from the sides or the top? Um, and I believe the pediatric one, if I'm remembering correctly, comes in two sizes, comes in a small and a large. If that's helpful, we usually, uh, most of our families find success ordering them online. Right. Thank you. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. And just a couple more questions. I saw in yellow too, but Safa has a question for you. Great. Hello. Uh, hi. Hi. I am a mom of, uh, my son is seven years old. He started mm -hmm. uh, physiotherapy, aquatherapy at two years old. Uh, at that time, I was, uh, he did his aqua therapy for two times a week, and the length of the session was about one, uh, one hour, and he can withstand that, and he can, like, uh, there is no problem, but after the one hour, like, he got, like, sh shivering, so right mm. now, uh, right now, I tried my best, because I was moving from one country to another, so until we landed here in Canada before a few years, right now I'm trying to find the best place for him to do the uh, physio, uh, to, uh, the aqua therapy. So mm -hmm. I ended up taking him to a private physio uh, aqua therapy uh, aqua therapy place. Center. It's actually a swimming mm -hmm. pool for kids. Uh, uh, so they, uh, I don't know exactly my his physio service suggest for me like just watch for him if he got tired or have uh, any uh, symptoms of fatigues but I don't know exactly what the recommended time for even the uh, the, the, the people uh, around him there they don't know exactly uh, how long the time for him to be in the pool he is type three but he's weak week type three now he week stopped injury. walking at the three and uh, his mm. face right now is stable he used the wheelchair but i don't know for how long i should keep him in the water i want him to be safe he loves the water he enjoy being there for a long time but i uh, at the end i don't want him like to spend too much time if i left him in the water for a long time he won't say for me like i want to go out but right. I don't want to cause for him any problem or fatigues. So, yeah. So you hit on probably 10 different things for me to touch on there. So I'm going to try and hit all of them. Um, so kids, as far as duration of session, I really leave that up to my kids. Um, our sessions typically time out to 45 minutes or an hour. And I find that if kids are working on therapy activities for a consistent 45 to 60 minutes, they're pretty done. Now that is different than saying, I took my kid to the pool and they played with their friends for three hours because that play is different than focus therapy. Um, and so if it's a therapy session where they're working on on therapy activities, I would probably start your son at 45 minutes and see how his energy did through the day when after he got out. If he's good, then I'd probably up it to an hour. At seven years old, that would be pretty typical. I'm not, and my concern with fatigue is not that we're burning out his muscles. That is an issue in some forms of muscular dystrophy, but not so much with spinal muscular atrophy, but just his ability to function for the rest of his day. He's got school, he's got to be nice to his brothers and sisters, he's got to be nice to you, and if he's exhausted um, because he's just done too much, that may or may not be his reality. 
So that's a matter of sort of balancing that personal energy um, versus a, a muscle damage situation. Does that, does that give you a, some place to start? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's a good answer for me. Thank you. So uh, do you have um, uh, any idea about the best places other than the private places uh, here in Ontario for like uh, taking the kids for the, uh, for the aqua therapy? I know um, in the U.S. we have um, our physiotherapy association has an aquatic section and you can go to the aquatic section and they will tell you where aquatic therapists are registered in your region. Oftentimes the pediatric therapist in any area will know kind of who's doing pediatric aquatics. Um, but it's, it's hard. It's hard to find an aquatic therapist that has experience with folks with SMA, be it pediatrics or adults, um, and has a pool that's the correct temperature. Those are all challenges. I 100% agree with you. I am from the Seattle area, so I am not familiar with any folks in the Ontario area at this point. I wish I had something better to give you from that perspective. Yeah. Sapa, for here in, in Canada, I think the best place to go to is when you're in clinic, your physiotherapist in clinic will likely be able to connect you with somebody within the community. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I looked around a lot and uh, I went to different places. Uh, but uh, yeah, as you said, like, uh, it's difficult to find someone who really have the experience with, uh, with the kids with SMA, but at the end of the day, he, I want him to swim, uh, and do whatever he wants, uh, or, uh, do what he's able to do. And I'm trying to help him uh, as well. Uh, but my physio service at the end, they, she gave me a sheet, uh, including some exercises for him to do if I took him by myself to the community uh, recreation center. So I can do that exercises with him. But yeah, I'm trying to give him the best experience. That's all I want. That's exactly what we should be doing. We are well over time, but we're gonna do one more question. And Yellow, did you have a question still? You're on mute. Hi, good morning, Jennifer, how are you? Thank good you morning, I'm well, thank you, and yourself? Thank you, you're very well. I have my son, he doesn't have any, any head control. He's 21 mm -hmm. now. Okay. So what's the best piece of equipment that I can buy to keep him in an upright position in the pool on his own? The best piece of equipment to keep him upright in the pool is going to be um, one of those circle collars probably. Okay. The Waterway Babies one, that blue one that I showed comes in an adult size. Um, How do you keep his legs down, with weights? That's it. Okay. He may need like another float. Um, you remember those one inch floats that the therapist had on her arms that brought him out yes. to the side? Yes. So they come in a two inch also. And sometimes I'll hook two of those together to put around the trunk just to give a little bit of pop. Um, and that can be between the head collar, um, float that can be just enough extra float and then the weights just give a little bit of contact to the to the pool floor perfect thank you popping backwards you're welcome perfect thank you awesome mm -hmm. a wealth of information thank you so much jennifer um thank you for staying over time appreciate that you put so much into the questions and answers and uh and uh, your your presentation was so informative thank you so much thank you well, so much um, for having me it was an honor to be here. Thank you. All right. Um, Jennifer kindly said that if we have an in-person conference at, uh, next year, possibly that she would attend. So we're excited to see that and see maybe you could bring some of the items along for us to try on and things like that too. Happily. Yeah, great. Okay. Well, thanks everyone. Ha hopefully see you at the next meeting. Have a great day.